Hello and welcome to Morning the Narrative. I am McBulo. The show will feature the top news of the week, complete with my observations, and even a little bit of snapcasm thrown in. The top news stories will be taken from my morning news briefings that I write on the, on the Rick Bulo new media blog every weekday morning. If you go on to like what you see, smash that thumbs up button. And now, let's go right into the news. Yesterday was the 4th of July, or Independence Day, and there's a lot for us to be thankful and grateful for this Independence Day, one of which is the freedom to live in the greatest country on earth. And Jason Chaffetz uh, had, read, had written an article on foxnews.com that said that there are five reasons to be grateful this Independence Day. He said, if the American spirit could be broken, I imagine 2020 would have been the thing to break it. On riots, a global pandemic, unprecedented political polarization, and widespread economic upheaval would be dispiriting to any nation. Instead of focusing on what, went, on what went wrong over the past year and a half, we should consider what went right. Because no matter how difficult our circumstances, the spirit of America cannot be broken. Though the list of America's accomplishments could be endless, there are five that I want to acknowledge this independence day for what for which we should be particularly grateful. Number one, American ingenuity. The top of the list must be the American innovation that brought us a vaccine in record time. Operation Warp Speed demonstrated what happens when government empowers the private sector, minimizes bureaucratic hurdles, and plays a supporting role in the development of critical technologies. We have always met the challenges in the past, and we will in the future. Americans were vaccinated, were vaccinated long before the rest of the world for one reason. We didn't depend on the glacial pace of the federal government to run the, the show, or glacial pace of the federal government to run the show. When the world needs something done, it's still America that it leads. Number two, selfless approach. I continue to be grateful for the men and women who put their lives on the line day in and day out to keep America safe. Our troops, our law enforcement, and our first responders are among the best in the world. They care and they sacrifice for the good of the country. Even with political winds blowing in their faces, these people can be relied on to protect, defend, and save in times of need. Whether it was healthcare workers during a pandemic, police officers during a riot, or American troops during a COVID-19 outbreak on a naval ship, America's fairness came through for us in, in, a, in a time of need. Number three, freedom of speech. Another reason to be grateful becomes obvious when we look across the Pacific at the once free city of Hong Kong. It's easy to take our rights and liberties for granted. But even as the great but, or, but even as great pressure was asserted over the last year to suspend some of those rights, America remains the enemy of the world. There's a reason you saw Hong Kong, Hong Kong protesters carrying American flags and singing this as being a banner half a world away. Our first amendment rights have been under attack. But America still leads in our ability to express others. Number four, generosity. This year has also brought into focus the importance of American generosity. America is the most generous nation on the planet. According to data from the World Giving Index, only 18% of, of the $427 billion in charitable donations made by Americans in 2018 came from foundations. The bulk of the, the bulk of charitable funds were donations, 68% in, two, in 2018, were made by individuals. The impacts of this giving are, brought, are both broad and deep. Number five, spirit of the American people. Finally, we can't describe America's treasures without recognizing her people. Those extraordinary Americans who do extraordinary things. Over the last year, there were many who didn't expect to be in the situation they were put in. There were people who lost loved ones, who lost family businesses, who were attracted by their violent mobs or lost their incomes. One near and dear to our family side was our young neighbor, Jake Clark. After a seven year fight with, with cancer, Jake recently lost a battle, but he won the war. I was amazed by his positive attitude and his firm belief that life is to be enjoyed. He lived with stage four cancer for six years and rarely would you hear him complain. He was positive and inspirational to everyone he knew. History is like countless others. 
We live in a great nation, and there are times of strife and desperation. Remember, the American spirit cannot be broken. We still have much to fight for. Freedom and liberty, freedom and liberty have never been easily obtained. We should not expect them to be easily maintained. Like our forefathers, we have to fight to keep them. It's a fight we are well positioned to win. And that is so very true from Jason Chaffetz. And, you know, okay, he, he brought up that, you know, freedom and liberty have never been easily obtained, and we should not expect them to be easily maintained. That's so really true, and one way to, to maintain it is to remember history. As this piece in, in the American Thinker from... From Terry Pauling's points out, forgetting history is so convenient. Because today is a federal holiday that celebrates a moment in, at which the founding fathers officially broke away from Great Britain to start a nation conceived in liberty, I got a message from my representative in Congress, Beverly. It, it is not celebratory. Instead, well, we did and see. Today we celebrate our nation's faith for independence and our founding principles of liberty, justice, and equality. As we commemorate Independence Day, we must also confront the history of slavery and recognize the, that the ideals of justice and equality have not been realized for all. In states across the country, we are witnessing efforts to suppress the vote and undermine our democracy. Let us take this opportunity to recommit to the fight against injustice and uphold fundamental freedoms for all people. I wish you a safe and happy Fourth of July. Best, Beverly. Yes, this is today's email message from a representative in Congress. This message speaks to, to what she believes. It is so defined by the Progressive Party line. It redirects us away from celebrating a great country and its history. It probably does towards assuming guilt for unnamed slavery that takes unnamed freedom from all people. Thanks, Bab. Just so you know, you don't speak for me or to me. You do not represent me. And as far as I'm concerned, you ought to take one of your story trips to Cuba and simply stay there. I have a few Fourth of July wishes. First, I'd like to be free to be grateful for the country we live in, her history, the wisdom of, her found, of the founders, and the freedoms I have enjoyed for the first seven decades of my life. I'd like to see those freedoms restored. I am bone very weary of censorship, manipulation, and lies by the media, the tech companies, and the government. I wish that our TV pundits would stop apologizing for evil. They're forever telling us that the majority of those in the FBI, the Justice Department, or any of the bureaucracy are good people. No, they are not. If they were, we wouldn't have a two-tiered system of justice where Antifa moments free to terrorize people and patriots languish in solitary confinement for walking into the Capitol building and taking a few pictures. We would never hear the word insurrection being directed at the patriotic people who exercise the rights of free people on January 6th. And we would laugh the likes of AOC out of office for over her needing therapy to deal with the stress of having men in the same city with those freedom-loving people. You want to make us your slaves, Beverly. We who want to live our lives freely are now told by the thought police that we are evil people, without the rights we grew up with. We who can look rationally at those around us and discern good from evil by people's actions are being asked to normalize every manner of, of aberrant behavior while you demand, we question our own intrinsic, intrinsic nature as inherently flawed. I live in an area filled with homeless encampments, black on black violence, black on Asian violence, home invasions, and some people accosted and robbed on the streets while taking a walk, a walk. And of course, the defunded police. I do not feel safe. I do not go in the many, alone to many places I used to frequent because normal life on our streets is unsafe, smelly, and dangerous. I am tired of always having to wash my back as I go about my business. I wish Beverly July 4th that is a celebration of all that is good in this country rather than a bugle call to white guilt. I will not ever apologize for being a heterosexual Caucasian who has made my own way through life with my head held high. I can tell the difference between the people around me motivated to succeed in their lives and those who simply want to prey upon others. Take, redistribute, and use. I can see clearly how taking away our liberty, livelihoods, and self-respect denigrates our humanity. How come you can? I wish for July 4th that says thank you to the men and women who died or lost limbs or faculty serving this great country. 
and ultimately pay homage to the men and women who has left the ideal scratch to this free country. I wish your Marxist ideology would die out be before it claims any more of our freedoms. I wish for a return not to pride but to humility. Humility, I realize, is a tough concept for the gimme generation to grasp. Humility means being thankful for the freedoms we have rather than strutting around like half-naked peacocks working on ambulances whose personnel are trying to rescue the victims of increasingly common stray bullets. Humanity or humility is keeping my private life private rather than trying to impose it on others. Humility is asking myself how can I help rather than how can I get me some. Humility is something I wish for all our politicians. Sadly, it is antithetical to our very nature. We can sadly only wish on, on this at 245th Independence Day that our politicians reflected our values. And that is something that should be said, read, promoted every day. I have a, li I have a list to to this article and, and the others in the comments in the show notes below if you want to take a look at it. And there's this from the Federalist.com by Evita Duffy entitled You Need to Hear America's Happy Birthday or Toby Keith's new song Happy Birthday America, whatever's left of you. Toby Keith, Toby Keith's latest 4th of July song, Happy Birthday America, will bring a tear to every patriot's eye, writes the Daily Mail. Toby Keith's, day, well, Toby Keith's latest 4th of July song, Happy Birthday America, will bring a tear to every patriot's eye, writes the Daily Mail. It brought a tear to mine, and I wouldn't be surprised if it brought a tear or two to yours, too. By its title, one would expect a booming 4th of July anthem, perfect to play at the barbecue or on the boat. It isn't. Seems like everybody's pissing on the red, white, and blue, sings Keith. Happy birthday, America, whatever's left of you. The song is heard to hear when we are supposed to be celebrating independence and everything that makes America exceptional. But happy birthday, America, is true to the United States in 2021 than any other song on your 4th of July play playlist. You were the daughter and when you saved the world. WW1 and 2. France would just be part of Germany now if it hadn't been for you. Now your children want to turn you in to something other than yourself. They burn your flag in their city streets more than anybody else. Indeed, 2020 was defined by Marxist race riots, the destruction of historical monuments, and a mass rejection of our once beloved founding fathers. In the aftermath, no, no part of American life seems to be spared from the Black Lives Matter inspired motion, notion of collective American shame. You'll find it in schools, the workplace, and the same military that saved the world, WW1 and 2. Right now at our Olympics, athletes who are supposed to represent America are inside humiliating us on a national stage before our allies and enemies alike. One athlete turned away from the flag on the podium during the Star Spangled Banner. Another said he only wants to compete in, in order to burn a U.S. flag on the podium. All the broken down cities by the next design. And the right can't seem to make it right most of the time. Keith is spot on about this one too. University and anti-science COVID-19, or unnecessary and anti-science COVID-19 lockdowns about America's most beautiful and historic cities to their knees. Not only have those cities been economically torn down, but Democrat endorsed BLM rioting literally torched the United States in 2020. Last year, I did live reporting from Kenosha, Wisconsin, after the Jacob Blake shooting. When I was there the second night for writing, I remember thinking how I never thought in my, that in my home state, a place I lived my whole life and is 90% rural, would ever devolve into, as I said at the time, something I had only seen in photos of war-torn countries. I returned for several days to talk to business owners and residents in the daylight and surveyed the destruction from the nights before. It was very crushing. Who are they going to count on when you're not there to take their call? Will the world keep right on spinning without the greatest of them all? Without the helping hand of God, your days are numbered, my old friend. We're sure going to miss you, girl. You're the best that's ever been. Keith told Fox News that he wrote Happy Birthday America last summer. It had been a screwed up 18 months, Keith said. I live in the heartland, and it just feels like everybody you talk to has the same worries. 
It just feels like the politicians aren't getting the job done on, on either side. And it just feels like, like the democracy is in danger, he said. He has never identified with the political party. He was raised a Democrat in Oklahoma, but became an, an independent in 2008. I was a Democrat my whole life, Keith told the Chicago Tribune at the time. They kind of disowned me when I started supporting the troops. Then I went and registered independent. One of the sure things about Keith, the country superstar who brought us American soldier, made in America, and courtesy of the red, of the red, white, and blue, is that he loves America. That's what makes Happy Birthday America so striking. Toby Keith, the man who was some of America's greatest patriotic dancers, isn't even wondering if America's best days are behind her. He already knows. He raised your number, my old friend. I'm sure gonna miss you, girl. Going back 20 years, courtesy of the red, white, and blue, one of Keith's biggest hits written in May 2021, captures the patriotic American spirit that brought the country together in the wake of the September 11th terrorist attack. This nation that I love is called Number of Ten. A mighty sucker punch came in, came flying in from somewhere in the back. Soon you could see clearly through a big black eye. Man, you lit up your world like the Fourth of July. And Uncle Sam put your name at the top of his list. And the Statue of Liberty started shaking her fist. An eagle will, will fly this man that's going to be hell. And you hear Mother Freedom start ringing her bell. It feels like the whole wide world is raining down on you, brought to you, courtesy of the red, red and blue. I cannot remember the Twin Towers falling down. When Alan Jackson sings, where were you when the world stopped turning? I couldn't tell you. I was only a year old. I don't remember what, the horror of watching the towers crash on live, t live on TV. The anxiety never sunk in that my homeland is under attack. I also don't remember the American flags that showed up overnight in front of homes and businesses and flew from curves and boats. As Marine veteran and Medal of Honor recipient Dakota Myers said on Joe Rogan's podcast, I would never wish for another 9-11, but I would give anything for a 9-12. People were proud of America. Growing up, I often regarded the zeitgeist captured in curse of the red, white, and blue as not an ideal or a legacy. It is America, or so, or so I thought. As I've grown older, though, things have changed for me, and not just for me, but for Keith and the rest of America. I don't remember the unique entity experienced in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. I do, however, remember being taught Thanksgiving is racist in, in elementary school. In high school, I remember ha being handed Howard Zinn's A People's History and hearing the same America hitting narrative repeated back to me as a history major in college. Outside of school, one of the most formative experiences of my life has been my trip to Kenosha, Wisconsin, where I watched an otherwise sleepy, sleepy Wisconsin city burn in the hand, burn at the hands of a radical leftist in their lives. When I watch Fourth of July TikToks, all I see is boiling hatred for our country. The flag isn't a symbol of national unity anymore. It's a symbol of racism and oppression. All these Fourth of July celebrations don't sit well with me, says one TikToker. They're at a point where the American flag is on any piece of anything. It screams racist to me. It screams colonizer. Fourth of July is officially canceled as the fireworks. Words of TikTok point posted on Twitter. The American flag of the 4th of July is racist. Due to America being the steaming pile of garbage, says another man, I will not be celebrating 4th of July or Thanksgiving now or ever. And HK tweeted and posted, I think this is on TikTok.com, either TikTok or Instagram. This is America and there's a video, I'm not going to watch that. This constant animosity toward our country, assassination of authentic history, and assault on America's legacy is, is overwhelming. But these do not even the best of us, Toby Keith. Can I ignore the critical race theory and whatever Abraham X. Kennedy is tweeting about? Though I still see a city, sh a shining city on a hill. 
I can see the America that can trace its roots to rugged pilgrims seeking religious freedom in, in 1620, not 1619, and when founded on principles that are established authentic equality during the Civil War, the suffragist movement, the Civil Rights Movement. We are two time World War champs and we triumphed over communism during the Cold War. Our fathers were not avid racists, but enlightened men who sacrificed their reputations, livelihoods, and lives. Which allows us to, as Keith, as Keith sings, wake up in freedom. Freedom, tested by blood and watered by tears. Maybe Keith is right, and America's days are numbered. Maybe something that's good about America is its history that's not, that is not being sacrificed by left wing narrative, cementing an unavoidable downfall. But I'd like to think that if there are that if there are still people willing to bravely fight abroad and at home, defend America's legacy, not just in Congress, but in the classroom, on the school board, and in the local city council meeting, then there is still hope. Maybe me saying this despite being too young to have experienced the America keep this famous best thinking about is another sign of hope. Or maybe it's just use, use, useful naivete. She is so true. Now, while she may have been young, young for that, I remember watching the dangers uh, that happened on 9 11. I remember the downfall of the towers. I, rem I remember that song by Toby Keith. I don't, though I don't remember hearing it. Hearing it on its initial debut, I did hear it a while, a while later, and he is so very true. You know. We are free, courtesy of the red, white, and blue. When I had my talk show back in 2012 and 2013, I labeled, I called it red, white, and blue. Up until the Saturday after the, the the 2012 presidential election, my theme song was Toby Keith's Courtesy of the Red, White, and Blue. Because it is for that laugh that I am able to do what I do. It is because of that flag that I'm here right now doing this week in review video. I thank God every single day for that, for the right to be free in this country. You know, the, there is a symbol of enterprise and exceptionalism, and that's the American General Store Got this from Washington Examiner by Selena Zito. The American General Store is a symbol of enterprise and exceptionalism. The Dubstats Country Store is sitting high on a plateau along the Lincoln Highway between Storystown and Rio's Corner. It serves Somerset County residents and weary travelers since 1903. When you open the heavy wooden door and hear it creak, creak with age, you get this says you've been in somewhere special. Not because it has stayed frozen in time, but because it has stood the test of time. Surviving all the winds of change while adjusting and prevailing through every decade that it has stood on its perch. From Civil War veterans stopping on their way to Gettysburg to celebrate the anniversaries, making the pivotal battle, to the World War I troops on their way to the 10th Regiment of the Pennsylvania National Guard Headquarters for Company C before heading to areas of conflict, to today's young family shopping for necessities. This place has seen it all. It was here where both shoppers and the owners saw Flight 93 pierce their clear blue skies on September 11, 2001. Shaking the ground under them when it slammed into a field just over the hill in Shanksville. 
Anyone in the store that day or next door at the Lincoln Cafe Diner stood momentarily frozen at the sight of the black smoke rising from the crash. Many of those same people then rushed to their cars to the fire stations where they volunteered and were the first on the scene up to clearly help the situation. The Dubstaff family is the third family to own the store since it opened in 1903, according to Mike Dubstaff, one of the five siblings who owns the store. The store was started by the Williamson family, who, bought it, who operated it for a while before Jack and Helen Springer bought it and called it the Cloverleaf Farm or Farm Store. Dubstaff's parents bought, bought it in 1971 from the Spanglers. As I speak to him, Mike is sitting outside the store on a long wooden bench with his sister Michelle. All five siblings have full-time jobs outside the store. He is a contractor, she is a nurse, and they rotate shifts, working at the store along with nieces and nephews. Next door, his wife Robin and their daughter Kate are handling the kitchen of the Lincoln Cafe Center. The family just bought it in March. The cheeseburgers are arguably the best you'll ever find. And they've added a bakery case in front of the diner with sugary raised donuts. What a divine. Only half of the small businesses in America survive five years or longer, according to data from the Small Business Association. And one in five, 19.3%, are family owned. The impact of the pandemic on small businesses has been mixed. Nearly 200,000 closed permanently, according to a study released by the Federal Reserve. Others are still struggling to stay afloat, but some of them have benefited from earning more trust from their customers than bigger corporate entities. Dubstadt said that that was the case for them. We closed for, I think, six weeks, weeks because nobody knew what the heck was going to happen, he said. But once we did, we were busier during the pandemic than we usually were. People told us that they wanted to come to a place they trusted and, and comfortable in, waited on by people they know. They also said they wanted to come to a place where they knew where everything came from. That's not surprising. The element trust barometer shows trust in large businesses has been failing for at least a decade. People still hold large businesses in higher esteem than they do the government and the media. Still, as the younger generation puts more pressure on large corporations to adhere to social justice to orthodoxy, that trust is likely, is likely to suffer. That's because more Americans feel comfortable with local businesses that traditionally stay out of political issues. When you come to this general store, no one will lecture you, unless, that is, you don't close the screen door behind you. Dubstats is known for two things outside of its great hospitality. First, having just about everything you would ever need, and second, having nearly all of it made in America. From the penny candy to the fresh vegetables, milk, bacon, cheese, and eggs to the fully stocked deli. From canned groceries to clothing. Shoes, sandals, steel toed work boots, and cowboy boots, and fishing gear. Almost all are domestically produced. There is even a, an entire corner dedicated to sticks of the iconic and colorful Fiesta Ware dinnerware made 100 miles away in North West Virginia. Dubstadt said that they are not experiencing the same hiring problems as other small businesses because everyone in the family, from the five siblings down to their children, all take turns working at the store. Based on the conversations with the siblings working there, it is a labor of love. This past Sunday marked the Dubstaff's 50th anniversary since their parents opened the, the doors along the old Lincoln Highway. The store's prosperity was never really hurt by it not being along the interstate because locals flood in here all day, as do travelers who prefer the back roads over the, over the turnpike. Several were on their way to the national parks, either at Shanksville or, or Johnstown, or who were camping, or who were picking a firewood for their summer cottages and camps at a nearby Indian Lake. Outside tents filled the parking lot for the 50th anniversary with children getting their faces painted. A band set to play, outdoor barbecue, and free ice cream for everyone. The Dubstats kept their small business up with the times while remaining true to their small town roots. You never thought you needed to sacrifice one for the other, Mike Dubstat said. I think that is uh, the secret to our success and longevity, that and making sure everyone who walks in here is treated with kindness and respect. Now that is uh, truly a heartwarming story and one that I think everybody should 
Realize and pay attention to. Leave a comment down below where, where, what you think about the, about that American General Store. Also, how did you celebrate the Fourth of July? You know, what are your plans to to remember American history? You know, had you even listened to? To Kobe, to Toby Keith's new song. If so, what do you think of it? Leave your comments down below. I have a link to the articles and the show notes below, and I'll see you in the next video. One of former President Trump's aides had started a new social media platform, and we and in the first day it had. Garnered, garnered more than 500,000 people and a few hackers. This coming from my good friends over at e the Epoch Times. Social media app Getter briefly hacked on launch day, former Trump aide. Getter, the former, or Getter, the social media platform launched by a native former President Donald Trump, was briefly hacked hours after it was officially launched, according to the firm's chief executive. Jason Miller, the chief or the company's chief executive, told Reuters that Getter was briefly hacked on July 4th and noted that 500,000 people have signed up to the site so far. Brand new platform and security and were brand new platform and security Pompeo is already getting 5,000 likes for a 4th of July post. The Getter user engagement rate is amazing so far. Miller, who left the Trump campaign last month, wrote on July 4th. Accounts belonging to, four, to several prominent users, including former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, Republican Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene of Georgia, and News, Newsmax and Miller himself were apparently hacked, as shown by a screenshot circulating online. The account profiles were changed to, to show the same message. At Juba Baghdad was here, free Palestine. However, the hack did not last long. The accounts were apparently breached at 8.30 a.m. and returned to normal by 10 a.m., recorded or we reported Business Insider. Baghdad told the website that he hacked the accounts just for fun, noting that Getter's team should not publish the website before making sure everything, or at least almost everything, is secure. But Miller said the hack was detected and dealt with in minutes. You know you're shaking things up when they come after you. The problem was detected and sealed in a couple of minutes, and all the intruder was able to accomplish was to change a few usernames. The situation has been rectified and we have ha already had more than half a million users sign up for our exciting new platform, he told Business Insider. The website had a soft launch in late June before Miller told Fox News last week that it would be officially launched on the 4th of July. Wo Wengui, a Chinese businessman whose arrest has been sought by the Chinese Communist Party, has invested in the firm, Miller told the Wall Street Journal. Guo, who is also a frequent critic of the... Chinese regime doesn't have a direct role or a financial stake in Getter, Miller said. I think a lot of people understand with the United States the desire for a new social media platform that's really founded on these principles of free speech, independence are rejecting censorship and canceled culture, Miller told the paper. Over the weekend, the website acknowledged that there are several uh, or that there are other technical difficulties relating to the rollout. Currently, our system is experiencing a delay due to an unusual amount of online users' registration activities, a message from the administrator stated. If you did not receive the code, we suggest you try again later, and please avoid submitting requests frequently. We sincerely apologize for the inconvenience, and our team is actively working to resolve this issue. Thank you for your patience. Miller did not respond to a request for comment by press time. And then there's this from Slate.com. Pro Trump social media platform briefly hacked on official launch day by Daniel Politi. Getter, the Twitter like social network set up by A's of former President, Don President Donald Trump, it suffered a brief hack on its official launch Sunday. Several verified accounts were on, on the site run by Jason Miller, a Trump advisor and a former spokesman, were hacked and, and they were changed to show the message. At Juba Baghdad was here. Follow me on Twitter. Please. Free Palestine. Uh, the accounts that were hacked included those belonging to Mike Pompeo, Steve Bannon, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Harlan Helen, Sean Parnell. 
The Pro Trump New Network Newsmax was also hacked as was Getter's official support page. Miller minimized the issue. The problem was detected and sealed in a matter of minutes, and all the intruder was able to accomplish was to change a few usernames, Miller said in an email statement. When asked specifically about security on the news site, Miller said that the situation has been rectified. Jason Miller's new, new, new right-wing social media site Getter was hacked this morning. That in, in a tweet from Zachary Patrizzo, Insider exchanged direct messages via Twitter with a user who claimed responsibility for the hack. The user said he carried out the hack just for fun and insisted there was an easy feat. They should not publish the site before making sure everything, or, or at least almost everything, is secure, he added. Several others had already pointed out potential security and privacy concerns with the platform. Although the social media platform was quietly launched in June, it got a flood of attention Thursday after political voter peace on its ties to Miller. Since then, the site has been flooded with pornographic images. An introductory message on the site was filled with things like anime porn and repeated copies of an image depicting Hillary Clinton's head. Photoshopped onto another woman's nude, nude body, Mother Jones wrote Thursday. The app is live in Google and Apple's app stores and describes itself as a brand new social media platform found funded on the principles of free speech, independent thought, and rejecting political censorship and cancel culture. Slate's Aaron Mack described it as a lot like Twitter, except with worse functionality and more racism. Now that I definitely do not agree with. You know, I mean, you know, I bet I have a, I have a site on there. As a matter of fact, I'll drop the link in the show notes below, and it'll also be in my contact information, which I have in the show notes below as well. But yeah, I mean, you know, I've been, I've been around get, I, I've looked at Getter. It is a very good site. You know, for those of you who were who who are looking for a good social media platform, get on there. And I'm, I'm on there. I know of a couple of other people that are on there. So yeah, check it out. It, it is a very good site. And there's this from the Blaze, also on. On Getter being hacked, new social media site Getter hacked hours after launch. More than half a million users registered for the new social media site Getter after its launch on Sunday. Though the website was briefly hacked, founder Jason Miller told Reuters, several high-profile alumni of the Trump administration were targeted by the hacker, who appears to be a pro-Palestinian activist. Miller, a senior advisor to former President Donald Trump, Said the hacker was quickly de detected and only managed to change the usernames of, a, of several accounts. You know you're shaking things up when they come after you. The problem, the problem was detected and sealed in a matter of minutes. And all the intruder was able to accomplish was to change a few usernames. Miller wrote in the statement to several media outlets. The situation has been rectified and we've already had more than half a million users sign up for our, for our exciting new platform. Zachary Patrizzo, a writer for Salon, posted several screenshots on Twitter sh showing how the accounts for former Secretary of State Mike, Mike Pompeo, Republican Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene of Georgia, American Conservative Union Chairman Max, Matt Schlapp and Miller were had their names changed by a hacker who identified himself by the Twitter handle Juba Baghdad. According to Insider, the accounts for Steve Bannon, Helen Hill, Sean Pennell, and Newsmax also compromised Sunday morning. These accounts profiles were changed to read either Juba Baghdad was here, Free Palestine, or Juba Baghdad was here, follow me on Twitter. Insider contacted the Twitter account that claimed responsibility for the hack. Juba Baghdad re re reportedly said he targeted the anti cancel culture social media platform just for fun, and that from a technical standpoint it was easy. They should, yeah, they should not publish the website before making sure everything, or at least almost everything, is secure, the hacker told Insider. Getter, short for Getting Together, is a Twitter alternative social media website founded by former Trump campaign spokesman Miller and Tim Murtaugh. The site was launched as a pro-free speech platform where users would not be the platform for sharing their political beliefs. 
Like Twitter, users can microblog by sending messages that can contain up to 777 characters, as well as pictures or videos. The website was launched on May 4th to declare independence from big tech social media oligarchs. Trump has been absent from social media since he was permanently banned from Twitter and indefinitely suspended by Facebook and YouTube following the January 6th riot at the U.S. Capitol. Though Getter was founded by Trump campaign veterans and several high-profile members of Trump world quickly joined, the former president is not involved and reportedly will not be joining the social network. I admit, I would definitely wanted to see him there. Okay, I followed the the former president on Twitter, and I like I like most of his tweets. As a matter of fact, I had even retweeted a few of them. But yeah, I mean, you know, you know, like I said at the outset, and actually, actually, what I'll do is I'll pull up Getter so you can get a feel of what it looks like here. Getter is the marketplace for free or free or free marketplace of ideas and what and here's what it looks like if you're interested in checking it out you know they have a list of people for you to follow some of them might be a little shady but Definitely take a look at some of them and see if any of them would would be good for you. The latest post is one minute ago by 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 War Room, which is which is Steve Bannon's political podcast. Mike Lindell, the Biden administration is trying to do as much damage to the country as they can before the the election is disproved. And another one says, Getter is a Twitter killer, which I think is totally true there. And yeah, so you, so basically, I mean, the outlook, or rather the, the layout is like Twitter. So definitely check it out. I'm, I'm on there. As a matter of fact, you can see me. I'm at Rick Butel. That's all one word, at Rick Mulo on, on Getter, if you want to follow me there. I post my news briefing on there every, mo every morning, and I will post my week in review video on Saturday. So definitely give it a, give it a, just give it a, give it a look and see if it fits you. Then there, and... Finishing up, there's this article from the Daily Call, a free social media, or free speech social media app hacked on launch day. This by Aylan Evans, contributor over at the Daily Caller News Foundation. The social media platform Getter advertises the site for free speech was hacked on its launch day Sunday. Getter is a censorship free platform described by its CEO and, Trump, and former Trump advisor Jason Miller as the marketplace of ideas. Faced difficulties on its launch day as the site was briefly hacked and users posted explicit content according to Reuters. The profiles of several large accounts, such as Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene and former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, was changed to show the same message. Juba at Juba Baghdad was here, free Palestine, according to Business Insider. The problem was detected and sealed in a couple of minutes, and all the intruder was able to accomplish was change a few usernames. Miller said in a statement to the Daily Caller News Foundation, you know you're shaking things up when they come after you. About a million new users signed up on the first day, according to Miller. Jason Miller tweeted out, Hunter Biden's laptop was real, President Trump. By the way, no restrictions on reposting this or sharing stories about where is Hunter's laptop on hashtag getter. Users also spammed images of cartoon pornography with a particular focus on video game characters Sonic the Hedgehog, along with other forms of explicit content, Kotaku reported. Getter is designed to provide conservative users independence from big tech social media oligarchs, according to a statement announcing its launch. The platform aims to be a new social media platform which celebrates free speech, rejects cancel culture, and provides best-in-class technology and user experience. 
Gatorism and a of ideas, we, we will not cancel people for their political opinions, Miller said in the statement. Miller had left his opinion or his position as a, a spokesman for former President Donald Trump to head the social media platform in June. The site has already attracted a number of prominent conservative figures such as Ben Carson and Dinesh D'Souza. And there and there are a couple of others, including my myself, like I had previously mentioned. So Definitely, definitely check it out. Follow me on Getter. I'll leave the link once again in, in the show notes below. I'll also leave it in my contacts below. And while you're down below, check out the comment section and and tell me if you are on Getter. If you are, leave your account information there. You know your your username and. If you're not on it, are you going to be on uh, on it soon? Leave a comment down below, and I'll see you in the next video. <sighs> President Biden is now launching a door-to-door -door campaign to vaccinate the Americans, and it's breaking some major backlash. This coming from my good friends over at foxnews.com says Biden, Biden admin are launching Dwight Roy Bush to vaccine Americans sparks major backlash. It's the better work of vaccine outreach, one critic reacted. The Biden administration is launching a new door-to-door -door effort to vaccine Americans after, feeling short, after falling short of its 4th of July goal of having 70% of the adult population with at least one shot of the coronavirus vaccine. Amid the administration's ongoing concerns of a surge of the more contagious Delta variant of the, of the virus, President Biden pitched his plan to boost the vaccinated population during remarks he made on Tuesday. Now we need to go community to community, neighborhood by neighborhood, and oftentimes door, door to door, literally knocking on doors to get help to the remaining people protected from the virus, Biden said. Taylor Collar tweeted out yesterday, Biden, we need to go community to community, neighborhood by neighborhood, and off times door to door, literally knocking on doors to get people vaccinated. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki also referred to the door to door effort while listing the five objectives of Biden's COVID response earlier in the day at Tuesday's briefing. Citing targeted community and door to door outreach to get remaining Americans vaccinated by ensuring that they have the information they need on how safe and accessible the vaccine is. Critics were quick to slam the new initiative on social media, including geo civil GOP lawmakers. How about don't knock on my door, you're not my parents, you're not the government, make the vaccine available and let people be free to choose. Why is that concept so hard for the left? Representative Dan Crenshaw, Republican of Texas, reacted to, to the president. The government now, want, now wants to, to go door to door to convince you to get an optional vaccine. Republican Representative Lauren Bobert of Colorado warned, Heck no! Republican Congressional Candidate Sean Pennell exclaimed, Vaccine education and conversation should be between a doctor and a patient, not by a grassroots government door knocker. Physician and Fox News contributor Dr. Nicole Safir wrote, The Daily Caller in another tweet said, Per seca says the Biden administration will engage in targeted community by community door community by community door to door outreach to get vaccine or remaining Americans vaccinated. A lot of people have big government antibodies. Don't knock on those doors. Republican Representative Thomas Massey of Kentucky said it's none of the government's business knowing who has or has not been vaccinated. Republican Representative Andy Biggs similar, uh, of Arizona similarly expressed. Whoever suggested that the best way to reach remaining vaccine skeptics was to talk about going door to door should be fired immediately. It's the better of work of vaccine outreach. GOP strategist Matt Whitlock knocked the Biden administration. How will the government know who is vaccinated or not if, for this kind of targeting? Daily Wire senior editor Ash, Ash Schwartz asked. And of course, Dan Crenshaw, and of course, we see tweets from Dan Crenshaw, Lauren Bulbert, Sean Parnell, Nicole Sefier, Thomas Massey, Matt, Matt Whitlock, and Ash Short, and Andy Biggs on that. 
And then, and there is also this from the, and there's also this article from Conservative Daily News. Biden team announces door-to-door -door outreach teams to get Americans vaccinated. President Joe Biden and other White House officials on Tuesday said the federal government will start targeting community door-to-door -door outreach in an effort to boost COVID-19 vaccination rates. Because of millions of Americans are unvaccinated and due to the so-called Delta COVID-19 variant that's spreading, Biden said that his administration will attempt to ramp up vaccination efforts. Do it now, said Biden during a White House press conference referring to getting vaccinated. The president said people will be knocking on doors to get help to the remaining people who are not vaccinated. It is part of a government outreach program. He said that is being set up as a mass vaccination or vaccination sites are being phased out. Biden also spoke of uh, or about how his administration plans to make the vaccine available in more healthcare settings. Those initiatives include providing more assistance to thousands of pharmacies, doctors' offices, and other medical facilities so they can distri distribute vaccines, Biden said. Vaccines will also be doled out at sporting events, summer events, and religious activities, he added. We are in in intensifying efforts to meet people out where they are, the president said. Younger Americans, Biden said, seem particularly reluctant to get the vaccine. The president argued that they are more at risk for contracting the Delta variant and that the strain is responsible for most new COVID-19 cases. Seems to me it should ca cause everyone to think twice, Biden said. In elaborating on the door-to-door -door outreach earlier in the day, White House P Press Secretary Jen Psaki said it will be targeted by community door-to-door -door outreach to get remaining Americans vaccinated. Now it's not clear how the, how the, how the administration plans to accomplish this and neither she nor Biden provided any more details. The administration will target, will first target communities with lower vaccination rates, she added. The door-to-door -door outreach efforts will get information about vaccines to people who haven't received them yet. The plan is part of the government's COVID-19 response after the White House Bell Shire with self-imposed July 4 deadline to get 70% of American adults at least one vaccination shot. According to data from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, more than 67% of American adults have received at least one shot and more than 157 million are fully vaccinated. You don't just give up because you don't just give up just because you haven't reached every single person, Saki told reporters. We are going to apply to continue to apply where we what we've seen have been the best practices over the past several months. The teams deployed by the White House will be composed of officials from the CDC, the Federal Emergency, Emergency Management Administration, and other federal agencies, Biden said. It comes as CDC Director Michelle Walensky said, or last week said that there are still around 1,000 counties in the United States that have less than 30% vaccination coverage. They are mainly relegated to the Southeast and Midwest region, she added. COVID-19 is the illness caused by the CCP, Chinese Communist Party virus. The Delta variant has not been found in every U.S. state. Health officials previously said the Epoch Times has contacted the White House for comment on the outreach program. And here is that article from the Epoch Times. Biden announces door-to-door -door outreach teams to get Americans vaccinated by Jack Phillips. President Joe Biden and other White House officials on Tuesday said the federal government will start targeted door to community door-to-door -door outreach in an, in an effort to, bo to boost COVID-19 vaccination rates. Because millions of Americans are unvaccinated and due to the so-called Delta COVID-19 variant that's spreading, Biden said his administration will, in, will attempt to ramp up vaccination efforts. Do it now, said Biden during a White House press conference referring to getting vaccinated. The president said that people will be knocking on doors to get help to the remaining people who are not vaccinated. As part of a community outreach program, he said that is being set up as max vaccination, vaccination sites are being phased out. Pretty much some of the main things that have been said from, or pretty much the same thing that had been mentioned in the conservative daily news report so let's stop it right there however there 
that link will be in the comment or that link will be in the show notes below so check that out as well but yeah I mean I myself am not vaccinated you know why because I feel that it is a choice and definitely not not something that should be mandated you know you know there's a saying that many a pro-choice or pro-abortion foes are saying my body my choice and on this I do agree with them you know the federal government should basically just stay out of the of of the American citizens bedroom stay out of their health care and stay out of their wallets you know so that I mean things have just gone way overboard and actually had been for about 20 years ever since 9-11 and there there is this from justthenews.com which says Biden administration to launch door-to-door push to vaccinate Americans by Nicholas Sherman over at Just the News. President Joe Biden announced Tuesday that his administration is launching a new door-to-door effort to get more Americans vaccinated after the country failed to reach its goal of having 70% of adults get the shot against COVID-19. Now we need to go community by community, neighborhood by neighborhood, and oftentimes door by door. Literally knocking on doors to get help to the remaining people protected from the virus, Biden said, according to Fox News. Biden's plan comes after his administration failed to get 70% of adults vaccinated by July 4, which was Biden's goal. The president said that 67% of of adults had received one shot of 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 the vaccine and that just over 150 million Americans were fully vaccinated. Biden said his administration will start to shift away from max vaccination sites and drives and focus more on smaller community outreach to target those who have not yet been vaccinated. The administration will partner with 42,000 local pharmacies and primary care physicians offices to target smaller communities that may not be vaccinated, according to Yahoo News. And then there's this from RT says Biden seeks to get more Americans vaccinated by taking message towards the door and mobilizing COVID surge response teams. Fresh from missing his 4th of July goal through COVID-19 vaccinations, President Joe Biden plans to ramp up efforts to get more Americans inoculated by sending public health workers door to door. And it's a, uh, and there's a very popular quote by Biden that now we need to go to community Go community by community, community, neighborhood by neighborhood, and and oftentimes door to door, literally knocking on doors to get help to the remaining people protected by the virus. Biden also added that coronavirus surge response teams will also be mobilized to combat new outbreaks among the unvaccinated. Benny Johnson tweeted out yesterday the video from Biden mentioning that. Biden's administration is aiming to make more localized efforts, especially in areas with relatively low vaccination rates, to get the jabs to more people. For instance, it will partner with local pharmacies and family doctors to to promote COVID-19 vaccines, and it will boost access to the shots at pediatrician offices. As we shift from these centralized max vaccination sites, we're going to put even more emphasis on getting vaccinated in your community close to home conveniently at a location you're already familiar with, Biden said. The new administration comes after Biden falls short of his target of getting 70% of U.S. adults vaccinated by Independence Day. About 67% of American adults have taken at least one dose, meaning the Democrat president missed his goal by about 8 million people, according, according to CDC data. Now, while Biden did not specify how the door-to-door interactions would play out, White House Press Secretary John Psaki said earlier on Tuesday that the aim would ensure that people have the information they need to, on how safe and accessible the vaccine is. It's not clear whether that would mean sending agents to every household or somehow ascertaining which homes have unvaccinated residents. Critics said such a, a program would violate privacy rights and lead to either to other abuses or conflicts, 
Yeah, so what does this mean, author? Uh, experience in this on Twitter? Well, the stormtroopers, I mean, friendly health, I mean, friendly health professionals have individual household level data on who has been vaccinated. I'd ask Uncle Joe, but he's busy ordering ice cream. That was in a tweet from last night. I did, however, offer more details about the surge response teams, noting that they would be made up of experts from a number of federal agencies, including FEMA and the CDC. These will, they will help states to prevent, detect, and respond to the spread of the Delta variant among unvaccinated people in communities with low vaccination rates, he said. Self-described news junkie Eric Sykes pointed out that if former President Donald Trump had suggested the door-to-door -door scheme, Twitter literally would not have the bandwidth to be able to display the high volume of Hitler references. And that from Consider Eric on Twitter yesterday. Florida congressional candidate Laverne Spicer reacted similarly, saying in a tweet yesterday, sending Joe Biden's Gestapo door-to-door -to, -door to check up on on unvaccinated Americans is simply a recipe for, for disaster. Another commenter said that although he was vaccinated and had no side effects, he found Biden's plan troubling. Isn't that what the president suggests, or isn't what the president suggests an incredible violation of privacy rights? Conservative activist David Bazell, president of For America, referred to the program as door-to-door -door vaccine checks and said that if Republicans don't stop it from going forward, they deserve to lose every election from here to eternity. That in a tweet from yesterday. Biden's comments reminded other observers of a famous statement by former President Ronald Reagan. The nine most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm here from the government, and I'm here to help. That in a tweet from Independent Women's Voice yesterday. And, yeah, so... I mean, you know, I think it'll be interesting to see just how this plays out and also how people on, on both sides, Republican and Democrat, will react to this, you know, but leave a comment down, down below what you think about, about what Biden's planning. Do you like it? Do you not like it? Do you approve? You know, you know. What, what do you think about it? Leave a comment down below. I'll leave the uh, I'll leave the links to the articles in the show notes below, and I'll see you in the, in the next video. In past videos, you mentioned me talk about Section Two Hundred and Thirty of the Communications Decency Act and how it's a, a burden to many people. Also, how social media companies such as Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter are using that and in basically stripping conservatives of their rights. Well, it turns out that, that there is a major player going into action and suing them. This coming from my good friends over at the Epoch Times. And it says, Trump announces major class action lawsuits against Twitter, Facebook, and Google by Jack Phillips. Former President Donald Trump announced Wednesday he's filing lawsuits against Twitter, Facebook, and Google over the firm's or after the firm suspended his social media accounts six months after over his well, six months ago over his comments after the January 6 Capitol incident. Speaking from his property in, Bed in Bedminster, New Jersey, Trump and his team said the lawsuits are about protecting the First Amendment, the First Amendment right to free speech. They argued that his rights were denied when the three big tech companies banned him. Trump described the major lawsuits as a very beautiful development to protect free speech in the United States. The suits will, will be filed U.S. District Court in the Southern District of Florida and will ask a judge to order an immediate halt to social media companies alleged shadow banning, censoring, backlisting, and canceling of people who express political viewpoints outside the mainstream. It's destroying the country, Trump said, of the social media's alleged control over political discourse. Twitter, Facebook, and Google said in January that they banned Trump over his claims that the November 3rd election was stolen and alleged he contributed to the January 6th violence. Twitter executives had said Trump's ban would be permanent. 
Facebook imposed a two-year ban on the former president's account, and Google-owned YouTube has said that it will curtail his suspension until it has determined if the risk of violence has decreased. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg, Google CEO Sundar Pichai, Pich and Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey were named in the lawsuits, as well as the companies themselves. Twitter said the lawsuit would Trump said the lawsuits will try to compel the court to avoid impunitive damages over the suspension. Trump argued that social media companies have ceased to be private companies and cited the Section 230 Protection Shield that such firms employ to protect themselves from liability. Republicans have argued that the federal rule has allowed big tech firms to censor their political opponents, while some have gone further arguing that social media giants should be regulated as utilities. The law, this lawsuit is just the beginning, Trump said of the suits. Section 230 of the 1996 Communications Decency Act allows internet companies to be generally exempt from liability for the material that, that users post. The law, which provides a legal safe harbor for internet companies, also allows social media platforms to moderate their services by removing posts that, for instance, are obscene or violate their services good standards, as long as, so long as they're acting in good faith. Trump's lawyers said the lawsuit will focus on provisions in Section 230, which they argued was created in the 1990s to protect children from harmful content online. The way in which big tech firms currently use the law as a shield has seemed argued over steps what it originally intended to do. They're not immune anymore, lawyer Pam Bondi said. Meanwhile, the former president also appeared to preempt his opponent's criticism of his lawsuit arguing that mainstream media outlets and Democrat politicians are the biggest spreaders of disinformation. Trump described mainstream narratives around Republicans wanting to defund the police, the, the Russia collusion claims, and COVID-19 as false. During his news conference on Wednesday, Trump accused the federal government of using Facebook, Twitter, and Google as its de facto censorship arm during the COVID-19 pandemic. One claim that was censored yet it was, an, was the assertion that COVID-19 emerged from a Wuhan virology lab last year. But earlier this year, President Joe Biden said many members of the, U, of the U.S. intelligence community now view the theory as viable. This was especially true during the pandemic when social media companies were censoring information based on federal health guidance, the former, the former president said. Since leaving office, Trump has opted to release statements via his Save America PAC and through a now defunct section of his website. The former president, who hasn't signed up for any upstairs media sites like Parler or Getter, said Wednesday that he isn't sure if he'll join Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube if the lawsuit is successful. Trump announced a legal effort is supported by the America First Policy Institute, adding that he believes thousands of other people may join his lawsuit. Google, Facebook, and Twitter didn't immediately respond to requests for comment on Wednesday. I say good on him for, for that because it is true that social media, at least the big three social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Google slash YouTube, have been getting a little too, a little bit too big for their britches and need to be curtailed. I know I myself have had a few of my videos taken off or community guidelines, which I still don't know what, they're, what they mean. You know, I mean, I've even had a couple of these week in review videos taken off. All I do is I, I I report the news. Sometimes I get my sometimes I get my spin on it, but basically I I report and you decide if it's true or false, and and you can interact and it, by interacting with me in the comment section below, you know let's engage the, the conversation on most of these topics that are being up during during the week in review. Then there's this article from NPR, which says Trump sues Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter for alleged censorship. Former President Donald Trump is suing Facebook, Twitter, and Google's YouTube over their sus suspensions of his accounts. 
After a mob of his supporters attacked the U.S. Capitol in January, Trump filed class action complaints to, in federal court in, in Florida, alleging that, that the tech giants are censoring him and other conservatives. A long-running complaint on the right of, for which there is little evidence that the companies deny. The suit calls for the court to order an immediate halt to a social media company's illegal, shameful censorship of the American people, Trump said at a news conference at his golf club investment in Bedminster, New Jersey, where demanding an end to the shadow banning, a stop to the silencing, and a stop to the blacklisting, banishing and canceling that you know so well. The long shot legal actions are the latest ex escalation in Trump's long running feud with the social media platforms that he used prolifically before and during his presidency. After the January 6th insurrection on the U.S. Capitol, the companies kicked Trump off their platforms, setting the risk of further violence. Twitter banned Trump permanently, Facebook has suspended him for two years, and YouTube has said that it will let him return only when we determine that the risk of violence has decreased. In Tuesday's lawsuits, the former president accuses the companies of violating his First Amendment rights and behaving like state actors rather than private companies and putting restrictions on what people can post. He has asked the court to order the companies to reinstate him and other members of the proposed, list, or proposed class of plaintiffs. He also wants the court to declare a federal law, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act and Constitutional, that 1996 law says online sites largely are not legally responsible for what their users post. Now, while in office, in, re in retaliation for Twitter's fact-checking of his tweets, Trump signed off an executive order attempting to strip social media companies of Section 230 protection. By the way, President Biden has revoked the order. In addition to the companies, if the lawsuits named F Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey and Google CEO Sundar Pichai as defendants, although not YouTube CEO Susan Wojcicki. Spokespeople for Facebook and Twitter declined to comment. YouTube and Google did not respond to a request for comment. Legal experts say Trump's lawsuits are largely doomed from the start because of the strong protections that both Section 230 and the First Amendment give the companies to decide what speech they allow. Trump has the First Amendment exactly wrong, said Paul Barnett, an, an adjunct law professor and deputy director at U New York University's Center for Business and Human Rights. He described the lawsuits as DOA or dead on arrival because the First Amendment applies to government restrictions on speech, not the actions of private companies. Even conservative experts voice criticism about Trump's legal case. The social media platforms are private property and the government town square are, and are very well within their First Amendment rights to refuse to carry speech of their parties. This principle holds even with the former president of the United States and as a constitutional right of every citizen, said Jessica McLuhan of the Competitive Enterprise Institute. This lawsuit is a publicity stunt done and in, intended for political, for political gain, not a serious legal argument. Previous attempts to sue the platforms over their content moderation decisions have been quickly tossed by courts. Last week, a federal judge blocked a new Florida law from taking effect. It would have fined large social media companies if they banned politicians. The court said the law likely violated the First Amendment. Section 230 has come under broader scrutiny from both Republicans and Democrats. In recent years, with lawmakers on both sides of the aisle saying its liability protection should be paired back, however, they are divided on what reform should look like or would look like, with Republicans focusing their criticisms on, on alleged censorship and Democrats seeking to hold the companies more responsible for misinformation and other harmful content. And then there is this article from Russia Today, or RT. Trump suing big tech giants Facebook, Google, and Twitter by Reuters' Octavio Jones. Former President Donald Trump has taken his criticism of social media to a new level by filing class action lawsuits against Facebook, Twitter, and Google, and against their CEOs. Trump's lawsuits were first reported by Axios, citing sources, and the former president later formally announced his intentions during a Wednesday press conference in which he said his actions were being taken on behalf of the victims of cancel culture. 
Speaking from Bedminster, New Jersey, Trump called his lawsuits a very beautiful development for freedom and freedom of speech. He said the lawsuit, in which he is the lead plaintiff, is targeting the big tech giants for their censorship of conservatives such as himself. Trump was banned from numerous social media platforms, including Facebook and Twitter, following the Capitol riot on, Jan on January 6, with many critics accusing the former president of, infl of inflammatory rhetoric and of setting violence in his post. Facebook recently announced Trump's suspension will last at least an another two years. The conservative nonprofit group America First Policy Institute is behind Trump's lawsuit. The organization is one of many on the right that have accused social media companies of political bias. The lawsuit filed in the Southern District of Florida also includes multiple other plaintiffs who claim they have been unlawfully banned from social media platforms. Some joined Trump during his Wednesday press conference. The lawsuit seeks an immediate halt to social media companies' censorship, demanding an end to the shadow banning, a step to the silencing, and a step to the blacklisting. Trump places censorship as unlawful and un-American. He specifically targeted social media companies like Facebook and YouTube, policing posts that they claim spread disinformation during the pandemic, including theories that COVID-19 was man-made, a theory that is now not as quickly dismissed. Companies like Google, Trump said, have been deputized by the U.S. government to act as a de facto censorship arm. C-SPAN tweeted out from President Trump, announced a class action lawsuit against big tech giants, including Facebook, Google, and Twitter. We are demanding an end to the shadow banning, a stop to the silencing, and a stop to the blacklisting, banishing, and canceling that you know so well. On top of seeking his restitution to ban social media accounts, including his own, Trump's lawsuit also seeks punitive damages. The former president called this lawsuit a game changer for the country. Trump's social media future continues to be in question for both his critics and supporters. He continues to release public statements, some similar in tone to his past tweets, and he even utilized a now defunct blog site for a short period of time. Rumors recently swirled that Trump could soon be announcing his involvement with Getter, a social media platform site run by the former Trump spokesperson Jason Miller that was launched last week. And like I say, I mean, you know, good on the former president for doing this. You know, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing just how this will play out in the future. And I I know of a couple of people who might who, who might jump in on that, but then again, it all depends on just who will jump in on that. Anyway, there's this article from Deseret News uh, on this: Donald Trump sues Facebook, Twitter, and Google over alleged censorship. Former President Donald Trump is suing to be destroyed his social media platforms, perhaps ahead of a potential 2024 presidential campaign. This by Jeff Parrott. Former President Donald Trump has not been bashful in expressing his ire toward private social media companies, and he is now taking that frustration to the courts. Trump announced Wednesday that he has filed a class action lawsuit against Facebook, Google, and Twitter, the Associated Press reported, arguing that he has been inappropriately censored from the private digital platforms. The lawsuits filed in Florida's Southern U.S. District Court were also directed at the chief executives of these companies, according to the AP. We are demanding an end to the social banning or shadow banning, a stop to the silencing, and a, and a stop to the blacklisting, banishing and canceling that you know so well, the former president alleged during a press conference at his New Jersey golf course on Wednesday before the AP. Now, why is Trump suing social media companies? Well, according to Axios, Trump, who has continued to hint at a 2024 presidential campaign, wants his social media accounts to be restored and is seeking punitive damages from Facebook, Google, and Twitter. Trump's class action lawsuit is supported by the Constitution Litigation Partnership, a legal arm of the Conservative America First Policy Institute, Axios reported, the law and Constitution are on our side. 
America is the great country that it is because our Constitution protects our freedoms, including freedom from censorship. This lawsuit ensures that those rights are properly defended. Constitution Litigation Partnership Chair Bear Mondi alleged in a statement Wednesday. In a statement on his personal website Tuesday, Trump has continued to push the lie that the 2020 presidential election was stolen from him which contributed to a supporter storming the U.S. Capitol on January 6. The former president was permanently barred from Twitter in the wake of the deadly January 6 riot. And last month, Facebook determined it would suspend Trump's account for two years. Twitter tossed Trump from his platform in January, setting a risk of further incitement of violence. While Facebook had indefinitely suspended Trump from his massive platform at that time, Republicans have alleged that private tech companies have broken the First Amendment by banning the then president and his loyalists from their platforms, even if the speech by those banned parties broke the company's rules. The Deseret News reported, in the past, Trump has accused the actions of Facebook, Google, and Twitter as a total disgrace and embarrassment to our country, reported the, 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 the Deseret News. The social media companies declined to comment on the announcement of Trump's lawsuit, the AP and Axios reported. Now, leave a comment down down below. What, what do you think about Trump's lawsuit? Do you support it? Do you not support it? You know, do you, if you have been a shadow banned or kicked off, these platforms, are you going to join the lawsuit? You know, do you think there should be a lawsuit? Do you do you agree with with the social media companies banning of all that? Leave a comment in in, in down below. I will leave the, the links to these articles in the show notes below, and I'll see you in the next video. Yesterday I spoke on former President Trump suing Facebook, Google, and Twitter for for kicking him off their platforms. I have a few more articles on that, so let's get right into it. We have this from the Associated Press, dated July 7, 2021, so, so, so just this past Wednesday, by Jill Colvin and Matt O'Brien. Trump filed suit against Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Former President Donald Trump has filed suit against three of the country's biggest tech companies, claiming he and other conservatives have been wrong wrongfully censored. But legal experts say the suits are likely doomed to fail, giving existing, given existing precedent and legal protections. Trump announced the action against Facebook, Twitter, and Google's YouTube, along with the companies Mark Zuckerberg, Jack Dorsey, and Sundar Pichai at a press conference Wednesday in New Jersey, where he demanded that his accounts be reinstated. Trump has been suspended from the platform since January, when his followers violently stormed the Capitol building, trying to block Congress from, from certifying Joe Biden's presidential win. The company said it concerns that Trump would incite further violence and have kept him locked out. All three declined comment on Wednesday. We are asking the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of Florida to order an immediate halt to social media companies' illegal, shameful censorship of the American people. Trump said of the filings, we're going to hold big tech very accountable. Twitter, Facebook, and Google are all private companies, and users must agree to their terms of service to use their products. Under Section 230 of the 1996 Communications Decency Act, social media platforms are allowed to moderate their services by removing posts that, for instance, are obscene or violate the service's own standards, so long as they are acting in good faith. The law generally exempts internet companies from liability from the material that, that users post as well. But Trump and, other, and some other politicians have long argued that Twitter, Facebook, and other social media platforms have abused that protection and should lose their immunity or at least have it curtailed. Now, while conservatives often claim the sites are biased against them, several recent studies have found that isn't the case. Indeed, posts by conservative commentators like Ben Shapiro, Franklin Graham, Dan Mangino, and Dinesh D'Souza are routinely among the most widely shared on Facebook. Now, the suit against Facebook and CEO, Zuck and CEO Zuckerberg says Facebook acted unconstitutionally when it removed Trump from the platform. 
Suits against Twitter and YouTube make similar claims. All three ask, ask the court to avoid unspecified damages, declare Section 230 unconstitutional, and restore Trump's accounts, along with those of several other plaintiffs who have joined the suits or and have also had those or accounts removed. Trump suits, however, are likely doomed to fail, said Eric Goldman, a law professor at Santa Clara University in California, who has studied more than 60 similar failed lawsuits that sought to take on internet companies for terminating or suspending users' accounts. They've argued everything under the sun, including First Amendment, and they get nowhere, Goldman said. Maybe he's got a trick up his sleeve that will give him a leg up on the dozens of lawsuits before him. I doubt it. Trump's suit is the array, echoed Paul Barrett, the deputy director of the Center for Business and Human Rights at New York University Student School of Business. Barrett said Trump was fundamentally misunderstanding the Constitution. The First Amendment applies to government censorship or speech regulation. It does not stop private censor or private sector corporations from regulating content on their platforms, he said by email. In fact, Facebook and Twitter themselves have a First Amendment free speech right to determine what speech their platforms project and amplify, and that right ex includes excluding speakers who incite violence, as Trump did in connection with the January 6th Capitol insurrection. Goldman said he suspected Trump's legal team knows it's not going to win in court and suggested Trump was pursuing the suit to gain our attention. Indeed, Trump's political action committee was already raising money off the announcement by early Wednesday afternoon. As President Trump last year sent an, an executive order challenging Section 230 that was seen as largely symbolic, it was always about sending a message to their base that they are fighting on their behalf against the evil Silicon Valley tech giants, Coleman said. Trump's move comes a week after a federal judge blocked a new Florida law signed by a Trump ally, Republican Governor Ron DeSantis, that sought to punish large social media companies like Facebook and Twitter for removing content or banning politicians. The law would have allowed the state to fund the companies $250,000 a day for removing the accounts of statewide political candidates and $25,000 a day for removing the accounts of those running for local office. But U.S. District Judge Robin Hinkle on June 30th granted a preliminary injunction stopping the new law from being enforced. The judge said that tech industry groups challenging the law were likely to prevail on their claim that it violated the First Amendment if the case went to trial. Matt Schroers, the president of the Computer and Communications Industry Association, a tech industry trade group that includes Facebook, Twitter, and Google, said internet companies have a right to enforce their terms of service. Frivolous class action lawsuits will not change the fact that users, even U.S. presidents, have to abide by the rules they agree to, he said in a statement. Since departing the White House, Trump has continued to repeat lies about the 2020 election, baselessly claiming that he won even though state and local election officials, his own attorney general, and numerous judges, including some he appointed, have said that there is no evidence of the mass voter fraud he alleges. And then there's this from my good friends over at the American Spectator. Trump moves against big tech a little too late. Why did President Trump wait until he had ceded power to begin to begin actually attacking the tech monopolies? This by John Jiang. Donald Trump announced in a press conference Wednesday evening that or Wednesday morning rather that he has filed lawsuits against the CEOs of Silicon Valley's most powerful corporations. Matt Zuckerberg of Facebook, Sundar Pichai of Google, and Jack Dorsey of Facebook. Trump, who was banned from Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube after the January 6th riot at the, at the Capitol, said that he is asking a Florida court to order an immediate halt to social media companies' illegal, sen shameful censorship of the American people. Trump also seeks an immediate restoration of his social media accounts as well as payment of punitive damages. The, the lawsuits, which are class actions, makes Trump the, the main litigant representing a broad array of social media users who have suffered because of social media moderation policies. Donald Trump is plenty need to be upset about when it comes to his deplatforming by big tech. Statistical analyses suggest that his online reach collapsed by more than 90% after he lost his accounts and that his attempts to rebuild his presence on the internet, such as with, with his blog, mostly fell flat. While what Zuckerberg and, and company did to him was censorship by any other name. Unfortunately, his big move against Silicon Valley has come too little, little too late. A string of similar lawsuits filed by conservative activists, in, including Laura Loomer and Charles C. Johnson, have failed to make headway in recent years. 
Courts have repeatedly affirmed that the tech giants have the right to censor whomever they please, up to and including the President of the United States. Trump's perspective does find some support, most notably with Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, who recently wrote an opinion arguing that the major tech platforms could be conceived as common carriers and compelled to obey First Amendment precedent on account of their concentrated control of so, of so much speech. For now, however, the, the proposed free speech position is in the minority in the courts, and conservatives have lost their best chance to move the needle six months ago. So long as Trump was the president, he had the ability to act unilaterally to protect political speech on social media. He could, at the very least, have forced the debate over common carriers or Section 230 up to the Supreme Court. He also had the world's largest megaphone and largely unified conservative support and would even have the tentative backing of some liberals such as Elizabeth Warren on the issue. It wasn't the case that Trump was particularly hesitant to deploy the powers of his office against private companies. His use of executive orders to crack down on TikTok came, came close to breaking the Chinese-owned social media app, leaving it in limbo until Biden reversed the orders last month. Despite the more urgent threat to political speech in the U.S., however, Twitter and Facebook made it through Trump's presidency unscathed. Now, why did President Trump wait until he has ceded power to begin actually attacking the tech, com the tech monopolies? It seems that even the man himself is not entirely sure. According to a statement issued by Trump last month after Nigeria banned Twitter, the former president considered a similar ban in the U.S. when he was in office, but he decided against, against it because Zuckerberg kept calling me and coming to the White House for dinner, telling me how great I was. Now Zuck and his fellow CEOs are the ones running the show. One thing that is shocking to me in this is is, yes, the fact that former President Trump is filing this lawsuit after he had left office. So, so as was pointed out in, in the article in the American Spectator, you know, it has come too little too late because he he's had the power of of, of the bully pulpit and the megaphone and to to do just what he fe he he feels is in the right of America when he was president. And one other thing about this, okay. Many people claim that Facebook isn't banning. Con conservatives, yet you hear this statement, or or rather you read on Twitter and Facebook posts about BLM burning down buildings, you know, Antifa. I mean, I think I had heard somewhere, and I, and I, I I might have this totally mixed up, so do forgive me on this. That there was a post from the Iran, from the president of Iran, saying that he's going to kill Israelis. I could be wrong about that, but you know, social media, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, is that not? against what your terms of service are. Why leave them up but take President Trump's post down? You know, that I just, that I don't understand. Anyway, there's also this article from the New Republic on this same issue where, and it says, Trump's, so, Trump's social media lawsuit is doomed to fail and work exactly as planned. The former president's class action suit against Twitter and Facebook is a typically ham-fisted graph of power and money. It can die in the courts and still serve him well. This by Jacob Silverman on Wednesday. We're going to hold Big Tech very accountable, said former president Donald Trump on Wednesday, holding forth in 91 degree heat in Bedminster, New Jersey. Trump introduced a class action lawsuit against 
Uh, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and their parent company CEOs, which he called a very beautiful development for freedom and the freedom of speech, demanding punitive damages and that his social media accounts be restored, while also telling a questioner that he wasn't sure whether he'd use them again. The 45th president sketched out an apocalyptic vision of contemporary America besieged by crime, fake news, a foreign virus that only he could control, and, most relevantly, censorious Silicon Valley tech giants aided or allied with ruling Democrat elites. With this lawsuit, which Trump is recruiting people to join as members of the class, he aims to tame the tech companies that have so far resisted meaningful regulation and humiliated the former president by revoking his posting rights or just generate attention the currency of his career. Trump's appearance was typically rambling and barely coherent at times, landing on many of his favorite issues and outright lies, like medical or the medical efficacy of hydroxychloroquine got a shout out. But it told us some important things about his post presidency plans, the likely fruitless legal battle that mega that mega conservatives are willing to wage against big tech companies, and even some of the deficiencies in the present attempts to tame big tech. Trump's class action lawsuit is hardly, as he claims, a pivotal battle in defense of the First Amendment, but it is very Trumpian, cynic, cynically capitalizing on a kernel of genuine populist discontent, dangerously manipulating public discourse and doomed to fail in, in some heretofore unforeseen embarrassing way. But most importantly, Trump now has a cause celebrate for which he can drum up millions of new donations. As the spate of early commentators pointed out, Trump's lawsuit may not have much of a shot in the courts, even if it ends up in front of a Trump-appointed Republican judge. As it is, Facebook's term of, terms of service dictate that all legal claims must be settled in court in a couple of Northern California districts. The former president's lawyers, for what it's worth, said that this issue should be decided by the Supreme, by the Supreme Court. The 44-page suit makes a bunch of bold and perhaps competing claims, and it has the linguistic feel of the kind of overheated lawfare that has become a staple of the MAGA right documents designed to generate attention and potential fundraising money momentum as much as take a legal claim. But if you believe that by banning Trump and the, and the few everyday Americans and the initial class action suit it includes, social media companies represent an imminent, severe, and irreparable threat then your time has arrived. If you go to takeandbigtech.com, you can learn about how to join the suit. Trump has promised what could become a large class of suitors, led by a team of high-powered lawyers, veterans of lawsuits against Big Tobacco and O.J. Simpson, which is really to say he's promised a circus, one that anyone with a sense of grievance and a suspended Facebook account can join. What Trump, a god tier narcissist, misses is, is attention, and the power that comes with wielding a, a social media mag megaphone that can be instantly activated to catalyze millions of people into potential actions. From MAGA heads to media stenographers who must report on his every utterance, it's guilty. Taking on big tech when simply a subject that could be invoked as a nod to conservatives' latest grievance has now become a matter of real strain or real strategic ur urgency to Trump. Who, is, who reportedly declined to join Getter, his advisor Jason Miller's recently launched social media platform, which was almost immediately hacked. In his press conference, Trump acknowledged that his fame means that he can generate attention without a dedicated social media platform, but there are clear difficulties waiting, waiting in the long term, especially if he plans to run in 2024. He needs to be posting where his fans are, and Perler and Gab and Getter are, are simply not the White Hot centers of MAGA activity that Facebook and YouTube are. Trump needs his own account, his old accounts back. Here I, here I reluctantly acknowledge the trace amounts of truth in, at the heart of Trump's complaint. Social media companies wield too much power over specific speech standards online, seem wholly unsettled, and Section 230. The small but essential piece of legislation that is, has immunized internet companies from legal liability for what's posted on their platforms may be in need of some kind of reform, if not the abrogation that Trump seeks. And tech companies have shown themselves to be rather cooperative, 
At times, with the federal government in, 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 in adjudicating online speech and surveilling users, now it's less clear what this means as Trump's lawsuit claims that Facebook is a state actor akin to a sovereign country, or that social media companies have become the de facto censorship arm of the U.S. government. By the way, government subpoenas for tech user data have been the subject of intense but unpublicized legal battles. No of real concern? Sure. But anyone who's been on this side for the last four plus years knows that Trump only works for himself and that the bullcrap quotient surrounding this affair will be noxiously high. However sluggish Congress's ongoing antitrust efforts might be, they're far more likely to yield productive results rather than a stunt lawsuit initiated by an attention-starved ex-president desperate to regain relevance and control over the distribution of his message. Trump's press conference was the old insult comic back at the mic. Working on familiar crowd beating material, George Washington, he will not be canceled. You have to you have to be a true believer to be taken in by the same tier tired pageantry. As if Trump's overriding motives weren't clear. There were occasional moments of unintentional revelation in his latest public address. Big Tech happened to choose the wrong side, said Trump, and they banned the right side. In his mangled locution, what that means is that we need better legal rules of the road or more tech competition or a devolution of power away from corporate giants and toward users. It's something much simpler, a purely man managing judgment. Big tech is the enemy because it doesn't serve Trump. This, is, this was always a mafioso-like logic at the head of Trumpism. And its latest expression could, could not be more garishly clear. However, Trump's lawsuit ends, it starts out a venal self-interest. The most interesting question to be settled might be who, beyond a few pay, paid-up operatives and mega cultists, still think otherwise. And there's this from NBC.com. Trump sues Facebook, Google, and, and Twitter, and class action lawsuits should have fail. The cases rest on the claim of Trump's free speech rights, or are being denied by these social media platforms, but private companies cannot violate the First Amendment. This is by Dan Dan Danny Savalos. Former President Donald Trump announced class action lawsuits against Facebook, Twitter, and Google on Wednesday that seek the prompt restoration of Trump's social media accounts. He will also ask the court to impose punitive damages on the social media companies for banning him on their sites following the Capitol riot on January 6th. The cases rest on the claim that Trump's free speech rights are being denied by those companies. Additionally, in the campaign against Google CEO Sudhir Pichai and subsidiary, and subsidiary YouTube, Trump and his, and his fellow plaintiffs ask for a declaration that Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which shields social media companies from liability, is unconstitutional. The reason that they reason that Congress cannot lawfully encourage private persons to censor speech if Congress is constitutionally forbidden from doing the same thing. Trump is right that it's generally unconstitutional for a state actor to suppress his speech. Since the First Amendment states that Congress should make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, but social media companies are not Congress or any other state actor, they're private companies, and private companies cannot violate the First Amendment. Instead, they may have their own First Amendment rights that can be violated by the state. Trump tries to leapfrog this article by arguing that the social media companies have worked so closely with federal entities that they have risen from private status to state actor status. Now, while this contention might seem fanciful, the Trump plaintiffs actually have a point. It's just that, it's just that the point won't help them in this particular case. Sometimes when a private entity conducts a public function, it may indeed be considered a state actor. The issue here is whether the service that YouTube and the other companies provide is considered a public function. It's a very hard test to pass. To qualify the function performed by the private entity must be traditionally and, ex and exclusively governmental. Even if the function serves a public interest or the greater good, that is not enough. An example would be a private group running an election or operating a company town. And that's pretty much it when it comes to examples. That's how limited this exception is. Hosting speech on a private platform is simply not an activity that, that only governmental entities have traditionally performed. Indeed, a federal appeals court had already ruled in a separate case last year that YouTube doesn't perform a public function. 
It's hard to see why Facebook and Twitter should be regarded differently under the law. Trump and the other, and the other plaintiffs may be right that their speech is being suppressed by these companies. It's just that no legal remedy is available to them, much less one in which the, the court forces the social media platforms to restore their accounts and pay them damages for the time they were shut down. Relatedly, the two main prongs of legal immunity granted to social media companies under Section 230 are so broad that most lawsuits like this one are dismissed by courts before they even get to a jury trial. The first prong says social media companies only provide information and are not editorial publishers, a classification upheld in an earlier case against Facebook. Now, since they are merely providers, social media companies are shielded from liability for information posted by a third party on their sites, and therefore most they cannot be required by law to remove any content. On the other hand, the second prong allows social media companies to take down content of their own accord. What's known as a Good Samaritan provision of Section 230 says social media companies can restrict in good faith content. They consider obscene, lewd, lascivious, filthy, excessively violent, harassing, or otherwise objectionable. Again, it's hard to see how any quid would deny Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube with the right to take content by Trump and his, and his associates down under this provision. But here's where this lawsuit gets even stranger. It may be that getting thrown out of court could be the best thing that happens to Trump and the, and the other plaintiffs, while the worst thing for them could be winning the case. If Section 230 were declared unconstitutional and disappeared, social media companies would, would be exposed to massive civil liability for the content on their platforms. Suddenly, lawsuits like, like Trump's would be more likely to succeed. In response, social media companies would then immediately start censoring any speech that might remotely cause them liability. They might face more lawsuits like this one by plaintiffs claiming their free speech rights were den denied. At that point, social media companies might be sued out of existence, and the platforms would disappear entirely. The internet could be reduced to kitten videos and have a nice day memes, and that's about it. Clearly, that's not the internet Trump and his fellow plaintiffs want, but if they win and Section 230 goes away, that might be what they get. Now, I I personally disagree with the, with that last part for the simple reason. Okay. I believe it was back in the 1980s. AT&T had a monopoly on all telephone thing, on all things pertaining to the telephone. Then you had, and, and that was broken up by Congress. I believe it was, I, be, I also believe it was that there was an antitrust policy back in, in the 1920s with Major League Baseball, you know, so I think that there needs to be some form of competition, and that's why you have sites like Gab, Parler, Getter, MeWe, as far as Facebook go, as far as Facebook and Twitter go, as far as competition against YouTube, you have Odyssey, Rumble, BitChute, you know, there's a thing called YouTube. I have, I personally am subscribe or have accounts on many of them. I have them in the, in the contact section. I, I have my contact information listed in the show notes down below. So take a look at that. I will also have links to these articles listed in the show notes below. And while you're down there, right below the show notes is a, is a comment section. Let me know what you think about Trump's lawsuit. Do you agree with it? Do you disagree with it? You know, what do you think about social media have, having a, a large say? Do you think there should be a monopoly breakup? Leave a comments down below and I'll see you in the next video. And that's going to do it for the news for this week. I am Mick Bulow. Again, if you like what you watch, please go ahead and hit the thumbs up button. Also subscribe and tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell an enemy or two even. And I will be back next week. Until next time, peace.